Welcome to Module 5. In this module, we are going to cover a series of chapters, chapters 20 through 24 in OpenStax Astronomy, that go through how stars form, how they live their lives, and how they die. As we get further into the textbook, um, starting a little bit in the previous module and, and certainly more so now and onwards, what we will recognize is that we are covering fewer and fewer of the small details of the textbook and focusing more and more on the big picture connections between the key concepts. This is because we're in a survey course of introductory astronomy, and although there's a lot of awesome stuff in this book, we are only touching on the kind of key ideas out of everything, a little bit of, a little bit of all these chapters. For example, this particular chapter, chapter 20 between the stars, is all about what's called the interstellar medium. And I took an entire course of that in graduate school. So there's a lot here that we won't be talking about. I'm always happy to answer questions that you have from the book in discussion boards. But these lectures cover the key ideas that we need for our specific curriculum. All right, let's get started. So as a reminder of where we've been, and a reminder or a thought to where we're going, what we've discussed so far coming out of Module 3 when we talked about Chapter 5 in OpenStax Astronomy, and in Module 4 when we started to talk about Chapters 17, 18, and a small piece of 19, is that there's a lot of different properties that we can measure about stars. So, for example, back in Chapter 5, when we talked about black body radiation and that spectral curve uh, when we introduced it, we learned that we could figure out a star's surface temperature by looking at where that curve has its peak. If the peak is mostly in the red or infrared, it's a colder star than if the peak is mostly in the blue or ultraviolet. We also talked about the fact that all of those absorption lines in a star's spectrum tells us about the chemical composition of that star, what elements are act actively present, and eventually in chapter 15 we added that it's possible to figure out how much of each of those elements are there as well. And then the last section of chapter 5, we talked about how the motion of a star towards us or away from us is something that we can also measure from a star's spectrum using the Doppler shift. Then we added to our understanding in chapter 17, uh, 18, and 19. So in chapter 19.2, we talked about how we can measure the distance using stellar parallax. We only talked about it briefly, and mostly it's making sure we understand that it is possible to use that to measure the distances to nearby stars. We're not necessarily trying to do those calculations ourselves for this particular course. We also introduced the idea of luminosity, a star's true brightness, where in order for us to calculate that luminosity, we would need to know how bright the star appears to be in our sky, the apparent brightness, and account for the distance to that star. We talked about mass and how binary stars are required for direct inference of a star's mass. When we study the orbits of binary stars around their center of mass for the system, we can figure out from the physics behind what we briefly mentioned in chapters two and three, we can figure out the mass of those stars. And again, in these particular slides, we didn't go through the calculations. That's not the goal of our curriculum, but just to recognize that it's something that astronomers are able to do. And then we mentioned that a star's radius is something that astronomers can figure out. For the most part, um, although the book talks about a couple of different methods, for the most part, we figure out the temperature from the black body curve, and we figure out the luminosity from a star's apparent brightness and distance, and with those two numbers, we did see in our slides an equation that allows us to figure out the radius. It's a lot harder to do than, than some of these other properties. But this entire list is treating stars as if there's just a bunch of numbers we can learn about them, and then that's it. But the key thing is that stars have an evolution. They don't exist forever. 
they form at a certain point and there are stars forming at this moment in time. They live their lives and they live a lot longer than uh, our human civilization is really able to think about, but they still have an end point. And in this module, not this particular video, but in this whole set of videos for this module, we will talk about all of the different ways that they end their evolution and how we're able to tell the difference and know what's going to happen to a star. Now, helpfully for us here in our solar system, the sun is middle-aged. Uh, it is about 5 billion years old, and it will live for another 5 billion years more without doing much of anything except for shine brightly in our skies. What we will talk about over the next set of videos is that the most important piece of information that we can learn about a star is its mass. That will tell us everything that's going to happen to a star as it starts to run out of fuel to power itself. But I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Let's start in this chapter 20 with a description of how stars form and what they are able to form out of. So the key thing is that space, although we often talk about space as a vacuum, it is not completely empty. It has clouds of gas and dust called the interstellar medium. And it is important for me to take a moment and make sure we understand that you're going to hear me and the textbook and other resources talk about gas and dust quite often. When we say gas, we tend to mean hydrogen gas. That's the most common element in the universe. Not always, but often. And when astronomers say dust, we're not talking about the dust bunnies under your cabinets. What we're talking about are complex molecules that are tiny solids rather than gas form. Okay, so all of these different elements, the same ones that show up on our periodic table and they form complex molecules from those elements, all of that stuff is called the interstellar medium. So interstellar is between the stars and medium, stuff. So it's the stuff between the stars. And it's gonna be worth writing down ISM and defining it because you're gonna see me um, use that simplified um, acronym quite often and, and say it as well. The reason why astronomers care so much about the ISM is because those dark clouds of gas and dust can obscure or alter our view of the stuff behind them. And the densest parts of the interstellar medium are where stars are actually forming. So we need to be able to study those locations to know anything about what those stars are going to look like. Now, the clouds of gas and dust in the interstellar medium have a name. They are called, a single one would be called a nebula. We use the Latin plural, so it's nebulae. There are three main types that we are going to cover in this course for the clouds of gas and dust. And it is important for us to be able to understand why they look different from each other because it's using ideas that we have already started to talk about and will continue to talk about. So let's start with an emission nebula. When we are near a very hot star, we introduced in the previous module the spectral types. I'm talking about like an O or B star, the hottest and bluest stars. The hydrogen around those stars can be heated so much that the electrons just completely um, break away from the nucleus, and those atoms are ionized. We learned that word very briefly in Chapter 5. The key part is that the electrons are kind of free. That excites the gas, and although it's a little bit more complex than what we talked about in Chapter 5, if we have excited atoms or molecules, then they want to be in their kind of lowest energy state. We talked about the ground state in Chapter 5. This is a little bit more complicated. That excited um, cloud tries to drop back down to its lowest energy level, and to do so, it emits photons to get rid of that extra energy. When it does so, it will glow. This is what we mean when we call um, something an emission nebula. In the book, you'll also hear about H2 regions, and that is a valid and important term. It's just not one that I'm going to focus our curriculum on. One of the most famous emission nebulae is Orion's Nebula. Uh, 
It's easy to observe with telescopes on the ground on Earth. And in this picture that has the kind of outline of the main stars of Orion, you can see the bright cloud of gas kind of where um, the sword uh, at Orion's belt would be. So if we zoom in on it, we see this magnificent kind of display of gas and dust that is glowing. Now the picture on the left is partially visible light, but partially additional wavelengths that our eyes wouldn't see. But if you have a powerful enough telescope on Earth's surface that you with your eyes are actively looking through, you will be able to see a slight pinkish red color. That comes from a specific hydrogen emission line, H alpha. We don't need to memorize that, but if you're curious why emission nebula tend to all have the same overall pinkish red color, it's because of that. It's because we're talking about clouds of hydrogen gas. Now the next type of nebula is a reflection nebula. The key difference here is that in the previous example, the emission nebula, the gas itself, was creating its own light. It was glowing. A reflection nebula is not making its own light. Instead, it just scatters nearby stars, the light from those nearby stars, it scatters toward our general direction. The clouds of dust tend to scatter red and blue photons differently. Red tends to continue going off in one direction, and blue photons scatter a lot easier. That's one of the um, big reasons why our um, clear skies during the day are blue, while our sunsets tend to be reddish in color. It's because of this difference in how photons are able to scatter. And to be a little bit more clear about it with a diagram, if we were trying to look directly through the dust at stars behind a dust cloud, the stars themselves would actually look a little bit redder than they're supposed to because that dust is scattering the blue out of our um, line of sight. However, if we are looking at the dust cloud from the side, the way that we do with reflection nebulae, all we're really seeing are the blue colors that are being scattered toward our telescope because the red continued off in that direction. So this process is called interstellar reddening. If we are trying to look past dust at the stars behind it, they will have a slightly redder color and it will look different than a star that is simply colder and redder looking. Astronomers are very much able to tell the difference between interstellar reddening and just red stars. All right, the last type of nebula is a dark nebula. It's a dense cloud of solid grains of material, so much more dust than gas, and it looks dark in visible light. It looks kind of ominous in this picture here. This is Barnard 68, a um, very famous dark nebula. And it almost looks like someone has just cut a hole out of space, like this weird void. I've even seen um, one not so scientific article that compares this to a black hole. They're not at all the same thing. All this is is a dark cloud. We can use infrared light to basically look behind that cloud. And when we do, we can see that there are just as many stars behind it um, as there are to the side. It's just that that cloud is blocking the visible light from coming our way. This is kind of like a more extreme case of interstellar reddening. The visible, all of the visible colors are being scattered away, but the even longer wavelength infrared light is able to keep going on its path through the cloud. All right, so we have a couple of examples that I want us to ponder. So these are pause and think questions, which means once you've figured out what the question is, pause the video so you can take a moment as long as you need to decide what you think is the best answer. So what we're looking at here is the Horsehead Nebula. It's named because it kind of looks like um, a horse head or, you know, a chess piece. Um, and what of our options here would best categorize this particular nebula. So pause and think about it. Okay. 
So again, it's, it's this particular piece here, like a knight in chess. And that horse head nebula looks a lot darker than everything else around it. That is a dark nebula. If you look closely, you can see a couple of stars that appear um, to be in that general area. Those stars might actually be closer to us in the foreground rather than somehow being able to be in the, um, in the background through the dark nebula. It's blocking what's behind it. And there is this overall general glow of other things happening in this area, but the Horsehead Nebula specifically is the dark nebula part in the middle. All right, let's try another one. This is the Trifid Nebula in the constellation Sagittarius. Which of the following options best describes this nebula? Okay, hopefully you paused. If not, now's your chance. If you looked at this picture, you may have kind of had an instant idea that it was one thing, and then as you looked more, you realized that there's a lot going on here. The key part to this question is that there is this option of other to remind us that it's not always cut and dry. Every single one of these nebula types is clouds of gas and dust. And if we have an overall structure of gas and dust where some of it is being heated so much that it glows, but other parts are just reflecting um, starlight towards us and even denser parts are blocking starlight, we can have everything happening in one picture. The tri part of the trifid um, might have helped us notice this as well. So we can see this kind of overall pink bubble almost around what looks like a very bright star. That is showing us not just the emission nebula, but also helping us understand what causes that emission nebula. Those bright stars right in the middle of this bubble of, um, of gas, of heated glowing pinkish red gas, that's what's causing that gas to be excited and heated up. As we get farther away from those hot stars, the gas and dust further away is no longer hot enough to glow, so it won't be a pinkish color, but it is able to reflect a starlight towards us as a reflection nebula, the bluer part, especially on the top of this particular picture. And then there are definitely regions that look like they are denser and darker, and those would be dark nebula as well clumpier parts of more dust than gas in this same overall region. So the answer here is other because all three of these different nebula types play a role here, but they are very distinct and can be picked apart. And that's one of the most important things I can try to convey here. So we will leave off in chapter 20 here. There's a lot more in the textbook that we aren't covering. Uh, and so I urge you not to worry too much if you see topics show up in the book that we haven't covered. It means I'm not focusing on them for our particular curriculum. Um, but it is worth making sure we recognize that this is an overview of what's available for stars to be made out of. Our next video is going to go into the process of how stars actually form. So I will see you in that next video.